Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I will start. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of obvious things missing at the moment, but we'll carry on. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners. Um, uh, and so on behalf of those present, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal and Gurungai, people of the Eora Nation. So on their ancestral lands at UTS stands. Similarly, I would like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this place. Thank you, everybody. Um, welcome to the showcase. I'm delighted you could to come along. I know it's a busy time of the year. If up front, I also get to thank people. So up front, I'd like to thank Steph Beams, the organization. I'd like, I'd like to thank Linda, who's outside helping, and Mark here, who's doing the audio-visual in the sense of um, he's, he's going to capture this. Um, this uh, showcase originated um, essentially with Shirley Alexander, who looked <coughs> up some things that I was involved with, looking at inquiry in science in particular, and she wanted things to happen at UTS that were broader than science, and give academics the chance to think about and promote the links between research and, uh, and teaching. So essentially, um, Shirley's um, baby, in a sense, and it's pretty she's not here for me to thank her for that. Um, and I think back to my time as a student. In 1976, I was a student in a red brick university in the UK. And it was a pretty well established place. And no one ever spoke about research to us. It was happening, I knew it was happening, because there were noises behind closed doors. Um, but they never told us about it. And we got interesting to the academics at that stage when we were graduating. And it was then that we were approached to think about research and perhaps to come and be research students. Well, of course, by that stage, they'd miss the boat. Everybody had found other things to do. You Not know, one person stayed on to do a high degree. There's a lesson there, I think. Today, we don't do that. I hope we don't do that. I hope we do embrace research and give students an idea. But whether or not it's actually embraced in the curriculum isn't always clear. Sometimes it's serendipitous. There's a lecture you go to, or perhaps something you've been invited to, or you see a poster. But it's not necessarily in, in, integrated into the curriculum, at least in the curriculum that I think of, which is an scientist. So this may vary uh, from one place to another. Um, uh, let's have a look at something. UTS has embraced linking teaching and research. This has come from our model of learning. We have learning which is research inspired and integrated. And I take this to be the learning that takes place at the graduate level and anywhere, in fact. Um, but I'm thinking of undergraduate because that's usually the hard place to do things. Um, so, learning which is research inspired and integrated. And that's hopefully what we're going to hear about today. Well, sorry, we are going to hear about what people have done. I'm very much uh, personally in interested in, um, in seeing people doing the difficult stuff, not the easy stuff. And that's what others want to find out. Okay, how do I bring it into a class that's big or whatever? And how do we make this thing a reality? How do we make um, research-inspired learning uh, a reality for our students? And could engage in lifelong learning, of course. Um, where did this happen, first of all, in science, in my science, which is physics? Uh, <clears throat> this chap, William Thompson, is a big name in science. He became Lord Kelvin. So when you hear about um, temperature or something in Kelvin, it was named after this chap, this Irishman, in fact, although he did most of his work in Scotland. In fact, he integrated research and teaching by accident. In fact, it was the fact that he needed someone to um, help him in the laboratory that he drew people into the labs um, because he had a need. Now, up to that point, we're talking 1846, <coughs> students in, in Glasgow University would have had a course in physics, but they would have been talked to, which is I'm talking to you, and that would be it. Once, it's, once he'd opened the door, and he was opening the door to his research. He wasn't opening the door to standard recipe type experiments, which became, unfortunately, the norm in some areas of science, and are still there in large abundance. And he opened the door to students coming in, helping him with his research. Obviously, it's a fairly selfish act in one sense, but 
when Seam got to hear about it, they jumped on board and, and, and approached him. And from that point on, the importance of laboratory work, at least, uh, became manifest, and um, the curriculum changed at Glasgow University. And others have um, described that similar things at other universities. Now, maybe you can go back earlier than 1846, but it's not a new phenomenon in integrating research and teaching. Um, my last slide is something I showed you. Please come down to the front. Thank you. We have um, just a little bit. I was wondering if I would, I would get to say this, but obviously I've got the opportunity. Oh, should you have a memory stick? Or you, or you Anyone else's? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, while I'm talking, do you want to plug in? Uh, oh, actually, it's well. Okay. This is excellent timing because I said there are two things that are actually missing. I, I was going to do a song and dance, but uh, the last thing I'd say, though, I should give you some dance. Well, we might leave that till the end. I think. Uh, um, just a little thing that, that that we're doing in science is to link our students in first year to research that's happening both at UTS but also in outside body. And we're, we're <coughs> linking our first year students in big classes, 500 students in the class, to work that's happening at CSIRO. And one of the big drivers for this link, and a, a big driver across the university, but certainly in science, has been Jim Peacock, who was Australia's chief scientist before Ian Cho. So the things happening, I'm sure, everywhere, um, this is just something that um, is happening at UTS and I didn't get a chance to say it, but I have now.